bigger than the BSC for this kind of stuff. So somebody out there appreciates it. But uh, it's, um, well, I, this is not a technical talk. It can't be because there's no way you can appreciate. It took 30 years for me to develop these models. You're not going to get them in an hour, but you're going to get, I hope, the implications of them. And uh, the relationship between nutrition and sensory is very important. Morley Kerr told me, he's the one who founded the Monell Chemical Sensor Center in Philadelphia, and I knew him. The number, you know, he's gone now, but I knew him when, when he was starting out. And he said that his interest in the chemical senses is because of nutrition. Uh, when I joined Frito Lay, they said, nutrition doesn't sell. We tried it and it doesn't work. You got a broad statement. And uh, because they tried reducing the, the oil content of, of potato chips to, from 30% to 18%, and it didn't sell. Nobody wanted them. And they didn't want baked foods either. So, you ha people will only eat things they like. I mean, they're not going to last long. If unless the thing tastes good, they're not going to be interested in it. And I think that makes sensory extremely important uh, from a nutritional standpoint. If you're designing nutritional foods, you better make them taste something people can eat. Um, my background started out in agriculture. Um, I was um, early on when I left. I, I left 50 years ago from Ireland. Of course, I've been back periodically. In fact, one of my children was born here, but. It, 50 years ago, I left Ireland. And a reasonable question to ask is, uh, from, from your sitting there, is, well, what did you do? You know, I mean, hopefully I haven't embarrassed you. So I went away for 50 years, and now I'm going to tell you something about it. And uh, I was in America about a month, maybe two months, when I discovered something very important that I'm not going to talk about today. I'll leave it to another day that has to do with soil structure and the improvement of chemicals to improve soil structure. And the reason I got sidelined a little bit with that was that my PhD work was on biodegradable polymers for food packaging. How do you develop? We are working with the chemistry department to develop them. And I discovered something accidentally that turned out to be, I think, important. It got patented in the US and Canada and had a bunch of international patents. Then I learned a lot about you know, partners that you work with to commercialize that. And uh, so it's 50 years now, and I'm back doing this again. Uh, two months ago, I was in the field in Idaho, in a barley field, counting uh, you know, plant stands. I mean, I'm still doing this, and I intend to continue doing it. So I haven't left that. So in a way, this is a cycle. I'm not going to talk about that today, but this is a cycle. You go from there to um, from our environmental microbiology to what? Statistical quality control. The reason I was introduced to statistical quality control is Ronan had done a training with, at the University of Maryland, and he advised me uh, to apply to the University of Maryland for my PhD with a particularly famous quality control expert, Emma Hood Kramer. And after I did my PhD with him, uh, I went to the University of Guelph in teaching statistical quality control, not because I was an expert, he was an expert, but I was his student, and I was teaching uh, statistical quality control at the University of Guelph to fourth year undergrads. Um, I didn't know anything about food, really, in a practical point of view. So I needed to get industrial experience, which is why I left and went to Frito-Lay to work in the pilot plant and learn how to make things. But um, it's in, there is a part of statistical quality control that involved taste testing, right? It's all the other parts, and then there's taste testing. And I got interested in the taste testing part. And actually, Ronan had introduced me to the triangle test uh, when I worked at when I first to Luntish with him. And... Um, that was sort of the beginning of my interest in methodology in regard to sensory testing. So for sensory testing, there's methodology that's used. I'll talk about the methods in a couple of minutes. But then there's also consumer research that's conducted as well. This all came for me through statistical quality control and sensory testing. So um, I spent, after I left, uh, I developed that interest in Frito-Lay, I spent the rest of my life now really working on these methods and the theory underlying the methods. Uh, which took me into the chemical census. And I did some work in pharmacokinetics that I'll mention at the end involving the chemical census. But ultimately, I really left food science. I went into mathematical psychology, went to their meetings, published in their journals, developed rapport with all the people in that field uh, because I wanted to develop models for the methods that are being used in the field. So it was, um, it was the... Uh, I, and then on, on the journey, I realized that I didn't really understand what science was until I was about 35. I used to think, like most people do, that science is about um, developing uh, an understanding of facts about the world. Right? I used to think that. I don't think that anymore. And I didn't from about, once I entered, 
once I started to interact with psychologists, I became aware that we science is more concerned with building models to represent what we see. And Einstein actually had a very good essay on the difference between religion and science. And they're both very similar, but they differ in the sense that we don't believe in our models in science and religion we do. But in, 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 uh, and that's a very important point to think about because it affects your flexibility. If somebody comes in with a new vision of matter, you're not open to it if you believe in your models. So all the models are gonna give you, I'm not saying they're all correct or true or anything like that, they're representations. And uh, they work or they don't. Uh, Box said, all models are wrong, some are useful. And I think that's the best way of thinking about them. So that's my cycle. But I'm going to be talking about Thurstonian models because Thurston was incredibly influential in a certain branch of psychology. When he came up, where he, wanted, like, he, he, was, he followed Fechner. Fechner began in like 1850. Fechner came up with uh, how do we scale uh, magnitudes, psychological magnitudes. And um, how do you, what he's interested in was how do you connect the physical to the mental representation? He came up with a logarithmic uh, relationship. Thurston was going beyond that to ask, how do we scale the, uh, the beauty of handwriting specimens or the beauty of art, which of course you don't always have an easy physical correlate, how do you scale that? And so he came up with the idea of building, and statistics, statistical thinking was around, it was in early stages at that point. He, he decided that he would use perceptual noise to create a scaling unit. So when you taste things, there's perceptual noise. So it's kind of like Z values. You standardize the, the, the perceptual, you standardize the measurement in terms of per scaling, these perceptual noise scaling units, and that gives you a unit of measurement. So it, it, secondly, he had the idea that when people are asked to, do, to follow instructions, to make categorical decisions, they use certain decision rules. And so those two concepts, the idea of perceptual noise of great scaling units and a decision rule are at the foundation of all of these categorical decisions that we make. And it could have to do with whether you go to war, could have a lot of things. But in terms of sensory testing, it's we give people tasks to do, we have uh, instructions, and those instructions can be translated into decision rules, and then we can scale it using Thurston's ideas. So this is a key to a foundation uh, for sensory methods, a thing that I was interested in. I wanted to know more about the models. You'll find out I always want to go to the models underlying the methods that, that people are using. So I'll give you some examples. These are common sensory methods. The triangle test, which of three things is most different? The duo trio, here's a reference, here's two things, one of which is beautifully the same. Which of, the two, which of these two are most like the reference? Tetrads, here's four things, two periodically the same two, two of each type, group them into two groups of two based on similarity. The same different method, uh, are these samples the same or are they different, presented in pairs? And then where does information regarding the sample to be selected is required, like the two alternative force choice, which Thurston was interested in. He was interested in which is greater of two things. And then the three AFC, would you generalize it to three things? rather than two, it was the same idea, but generalized. And then identification, uh, here is a sample we've trained you on, can you recognize it or not? And sometimes you have to do that because you can't have two, like tobacco samples, uh, nicotine can only be, you only get so much exposure, so you have to use a method like that if you're going to, to do that. Uh, we work with clients, the Institute for Perception is a commercial profit-making entity that works with clients. We worked with eight out of 10 of the global food, com food companies at this point. So we work with clients in these areas, and what they're interested in is, which, which method should I use? What's the best method for my application? <laughs> and <clears throat> all the, are they all equivalent? Well, there, it turns out they're not. They're not even close to being equivalent at picking up sensory differences uh, between food products for various reasons. You might want to find out whether or not you can make a more healthful alternative. You might want to reduce cost. There's all these reasons why people do sensory testing. And, uh, but you have methods. And uh, Gordon, I mean, um, Ronan introduced me to the triangle test. There was the one method that he told me about. Um, all right, so the business, does it make any difference if you choose different methods? Well, here's where this really excites and interests people in management. They don't have to know anything about models. They can hardly know anything about sensory methodology, but they're interested in this, what I'm about to show you. That if you want, say you have a sensory difference, such that if I give you a pair of samples, 76% of the time you will say one is greater than the other. Let's say it's Miller Lite versus Bud Light. We do this for claim support for, 
for Miller. Miller like but Miller tends to have more taste than Bud Light. And it actually does. It's a little bit more bitter. So they claim to have more taste than Bud Light. So if 76% of people were to say in, the, in that test that, that, um, that they would choose in blind test uh, Miller Lite over Bud Light, if that was to be the case, it doesn't turn out to be the case. It's about 66%, 65%, but it is more. Um, that's what we call a delta of one. In other words, it's, it's a one standard unit, standard unit difference on a, based on the perceptual intensity distribution that underlies the, uh, the decision that the person makes. You give a person a sample, they sample it a second time or a third time, it won't be always the same, it'll follow the distribution. We're talking about one standard deviation unit difference between them, that corresponds to 76% in the two AFC. Now I've given you a reference of what I mean by a delta of one. All right, so now we use that delta of one and ask, what would happen if we did the triangle test, the duo tree or the tree AFC? How would they perform? What would the sample size requirement be for an equivalent power of 80% chance? And we're the chance of detecting a difference, a, a difference of this amount with an alpha level of 5%. Well, with the two AFC, you need 26 people. But with the duo tree, you need 241 people or judgments. They could be replicated people. For the tree AFC, you need 22, and for the triangle, you need 220. So what are you doing with the triangle test? If the triangle test needs 220 to pick up a pretty obvious difference of delta of one, why are we doing triangle testing? And it, in fact, the triangle test is 100 times more sample size when the difference is very small. Let's say it's 0.5. Now you need 100 times. So the triangle test was developed in 1940, I believe, at Gilby's. And they didn't know anything about this. And had they known about it, maybe they would have thought twice about it. So they, 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 we have a new method now, the tetrad method, that actually has the same advantages of the triangle of the duo trio, but it, does, it requires one third the sample size. And Gilby, uh, not Gilby, but uh, uh, General Mills, when they found out about this, they immediately adopted that. And they reduced their pound sizes to, to accommodate that. So where this, it gets me, for me, got very interesting was this paradox. You have the triangle test. It involves which one is different. You have the three AFC, same samples, same people, bitterness solutions. It goes back to 1950s. This experiment was done. They both have guessing probabilities of a third. Which, which one of the three is the most? Now, it's, I'm going to give you a result that doesn't depend on whether you knew what the attribute was. You could tell people in the triangle test, focus on bitterness and tell me the answer to the question of which is most different, and you'll have the same result. So that's not the explanation, and you'll see in a second what it is. So you have these chance probabilities. All these experiments were conducted, including Bars and Abrams, 1953, that shows that the triangle test will show a, the triangle test will show a much lower probability of correct response than the three AFC. And you'd have to wonder why. I mean, same people, same thing, they know about bitterness, yet you're getting this kind of huge difference between the two. 32 to 21, 62 to 42, 539 to 363, 161 to 104. Why is, what's causing that? And um, you won't understand what's causing it unless you build and test the model. So those are the results. But when we translate those results into delta values, knowing what the model is, what happens? They all become the same. Those results, exact same results, are measuring, so what it is, is that these two methods are actually tapping in to the same underlying sensory difference, but one is less able to pick up the difference than the other. Why? Because the decision rules are working against the triangle test, and it's not in the tree AFC. And that is a result that people in industry really want to know about, because they don't want to use a method. That it, it, the problem is triangle test is a much larger variance, and it, it's in, based on distance comparisons. And the tree AFC is not based on this, it's based on actual magnitudes. So that is, that is, to me, this was the start. When I saw this, at first I was thinking, I'd been hired to work for years, I was working at this time in industry, and I said, I don't know what I'm doing here. Because if you can get this kind of thing, and I'm not uh, you know, aware of it, how many more methods am I going to recommend to my clients, or to my boss, or whatever, that are not as good as they could be? How often am I saying, we didn't find a difference here, let's make a change, and I shouldn't have said that. It was just because of my method. So um, these, the reason for these effects is that in the 3AFC and the 2AFC, the probability of correct response goes up much faster at small differences than it does for um, the triangle test. Triangle test drags around at small differences and won't respond at all, 
until it starts to get very large. And there's no point in using a triangle test for small difference, but that's why you do different tests, isn't it? To detect small differences. So the very purpose of doing the test is not uh, cons co consistent with its characteristics. So for any delta value, two and three assuming methods yield higher probability of correct response than zero, three and triangle. That's known now. And now we know the tetrad method uh, is capable of picking up differences that are about one third the sample size of the triangle test. The reason people wouldn't use the 2AFC and 3AFC is because they don't know what the attribute is. So they want to have a general method for, I don't know what the attribute is, I want to be able to conduct the test without specifying an attribute. Okay, but that's true of the tetrad test too. The tetrad test where you get four samples, two, two are the same, uh, uh, you know, two groups are the same, and you're asked to group them into two groups of two based on similarity. That's all you have to do. It's a very easy test to do, just as easy as the triangle test, but you can do it with one third the sample size. That makes important commercial significance. And it's also very interesting theoretically to know this because now we know we need to develop all these models for all these methods. And we need to understand them all. And that's where I entered this, is working on these in general and working on the, the probabilistic models. You can, all methods really can be, uh, now going beyond just the triangle test or tree here, to say that there are, whenever you're considering a method, you have information to consider and you've got the decision rule to consider, right? That's what we were saying about Thurston. You can have deterministic information and you can have probabilistic information, meaning that you think that uh, stimuli are precise valued. Now, as food scientists, we immediately don't believe that because we're used to measuring variation in food, right? So we go into it not thinking that. But again, this is the contrast with psychology. The psychologists tend to think or want to think that stimuli are precise valued. They, they, design, they design their experiments that way, get rid of all the stimulus variability so that they are as close to being precise valued as possible. Um, if you have deterministic decision rule, the deterministic decision rule means that given the same information, I would give the same answer exactly the next time you give me the test, okay? You get the test. If I knew what the information that you're working with is, it will, it's like uh, science, Okay, tends to have that concept of determinism. That is, if we conduct an experiment, we add hydro, uh, hydrochloric acid to sodium hydroxide, we're expecting to get a result, a certain result, and we get it every time. That's determinism. So we're saying that if you have a deterministic decision rule, which we, which we do often have, we have a triangle test, do a trio, and we have deterministic information, you never get uncertainty, you never get variation, and that never happens. So we have no interest in those types of models. The type of models we are interested in are the ones that, that Thurston was interested in is probabilistic information. That is, information varies from sample to sample, from moment to moment. And there are three reasons for that. One is that the stimulus varies. Two things of potato chips are not always the same uh, when you pour them out. They have different amounts of, of cheese flavor on, different amounts of salt. So there's going to be vari variation. Okay. There's also neural variation in your certain nervous system's variation. You don't see things the same way every time. People will see things on a blank screen that weren't there. You have that. And the third thing is you've, you have perioreceptor variation. That's variation in a composition of saliva around a neuron. So you have all that sources of variation. Thurston was aware of that. So his models are type ones. They're difference testing methods, preference, ratings. They're all probabilistic information, but deterministic decision rules. Now over here in this area of probabilistic decision rules comes a deterministic multidimensional scaling. Uh, Shepard developed multidimensional scaling in the late 50s. And he had the idea that stimuli are fixed. They're not, don't vary. Um, and so multidimensional, if you ever use multidimensional scaling, you're buying into that assumption that the stimuli, that when you get these maps, they're not distribution maps, they're individual points in a perceptual space. And, uh, and unfolding, which I'll mention in a few minutes. That's all type two. And then we have the probabilistic, you have the uh, type threes, which say we have a probabilistic decision rule and we have probabilistic information. A probabilistic decision rule is something like uh, similarity is an exponential decay function of distance. As distance gets bigger, similarity goes down. That's a, that's a pro probabilistic decision rule. It's not saying that um, you get the same information every time. It's saying that, that there's, a, there's a function that governs that. Uh, LSA and uh, all these methods. So it's good to think in terms of which type of method I have here, because each one of them gives different models. All right. So I 
Are you guys with me so far? Okay, not too technical. Okay, is it? All right, but important though, right? Extremely important in industry to get this straight. And extremely important in your own thinking about experiments you conduct if you're in this field to get it straight. Okay, so we have, we've covered all that stuff. All right, now we go to, to this is now a little bit of mathematics. This is all I'm gonna give you, just to give you a sense of what had to be done. Like the job that I had to do was to think about all these different methods that are out there. And on uh, taking Thurston's lead, go back and work out the mathematical models that correspond to each one of these so that I can make predictions. So this is what science is. Science is you build models uh, that are testable, like, like Boyle's law. Okay, now Boyle's the father of chemistry, a guy from Waterford, right? You know about him, and he was, he was, his, his father was the Earl of Cork. He, uh, he's credited with being the father of chemistry because he had a model. And now, it's not always going to work perfectly, but he has a, had a model that, that, was, that brought al chemistry of alchemy into science. So we're going to talk about models here. Now, I, you have to go back. You have to work out the mathematics. That's all in that Thurstonian modeling book. And as I've said, I wrote it uh, and put it together and, and published it in 2016 before it gets to the day where I won't understand this stuff anymore. And it will happen. And I'll someday look at this and wonder, how did I do this? Okay, so, um, and I'd summarize other people's models too. I'm not the only one working in this area, lots of people are. And so it has other models in there too. Okay, so the choice probability is a function of what? It's a function, you can think of it as a weighted sum. Uh, the, the F function, there's supposed to be, yeah, there, yeah. The F function is really averaging over trials. So you, give, you think of lots of trials and you're giving people a test and there's a decision rule involved in it, and there's probabilistic information. So F covers the likelihood part. This is the multivariate normal or the univariate normal, whatever governs the distribution that covers the variation. And then we have the decision part. So we, the product of the decision a person makes and the probabilistic information. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I'm just wondering, there's a key copy up there for you guys for the last hour. Are you looking to skip on that? Or? So you have these two parts and you're averaging over trials. That's a way of thinking about it. Examples are probability character response and discrimination tests, like the same different, same different probabilities in uh, same different method, probability of a rating. Like people think of ratings as being continuous. They're not continuous. They're just categorical. Using an instrument, you get categorical re responses and you can model them the same way. Or preference probability. This is important in economics and psychology in food science. They're all, all important. So that's how it works. You've got information varies, and you have a decision rule, and you average over trials. Okay, and that leads to all these equations. And I don't want you to just look. I, all I want you to do is see that these equations exist. And you can look, you can go to the book, and you can derive, or you can look at the derivations of all these equations. But without these equations, we won't be able to make any predictions. Some of these were already known before I got involved in them. Duo trio, 3AFC, 2AFC were all already in the literature. You'll find them in the quantitative psychology literature. And this is why I want to see a connection between food science and psychology, because the psychologists have been thinking about this stuff for a long time. And many of the mathematical psychologists have worked on these things. And we as food scientists need to pick up what they've done and use it, because it's useful. You know, so that's the triangular method. Okay. So then you have um, the dual pair, which we worked on. This, that's a new contribution uh, that Benoit Rousseau worked on with me. Uh, multiple dual pair. Um, that's a method that has four stimuli in it. Um, the tetrad method that my son worked on, and my son, John, he's a mathematician. He worked tirelessly to promote the method of tetrads. And he's very successful at getting it up. So those are two equations he developed with me when he was a third year undergrad. You publish in the British Journal of Mathematical Statistical Psychology, and from it you can derive, you can you can predict all these results that we can get. Ratings, ratings have a model too, and then you have preferential choice, which is important, as I said, in a number of different fields. And then you have all these models for same different. You've got um, is the difference smaller than some criterion? That's the tau model. Is the is the distance based on is the decision based on um, a, uh, a particular Euclidean Gaussian function of distance, or is it uh, the city block exponential decay with Shepard? Now, these two I'll just bring to your attention. The, the city block exponential decay model 
Roger Shepard proposed as a unit, he published a paper in Science in 1987, as a universal law for psychological science. But he was working with determinism at the stimulus level. And so he missed a number of cases. He, he said in his paper that for 10%, he couldn't explain, that it came out as Euclidean Gaussian. And I published a comment in Science uh, about this because uh, if, you do, if you view stimuli as fixed, you have a blind spot. And I think this is a general blind spot that exists in psychology. I'm just going to say, if you're a psychologist, you're, you're, you're prone to this, that you will do experiments, you'll interpret results, and you, you could um, uh, easily miss important things because you haven't considered stimulus variability. Another, in, the, in that book, you'll find at the back, there's a guy called Eddie Zafarov. He's a, he's a very, very good Russian mathematical psychologist. And he was arguing for a, a, a rethinking of the Thurstonian structure because of some things that he discovered. Well, he was again thinking in terms of precise valued stimuli. And as food scientists, we wouldn't think that. We wouldn't fall into that trap, if you want to call it that. But I think psychologists have that blind spot. And I would recommend that they think about that because think about all the variation that goes on in stimuli because you can be led to, in, to different conclusions. So those are just to give you a sense of the, the, that the models exist out there and that they can be used. They're in that book, um, they're in the software. Our company, um, well, we do basic research and publish it. We teach courses, but we also develop software that turns all this stuff into something you can push a button and get the answer to, which people like to know it's there. They like to be able to check on it, but they want to also make it easy to use it. Okay, so that was one body of brilliance that came from Thurston that I want to just say. Here's another one. Uh, this is Coombs in 1950. Unfolding. Um, the idea of unfolding is now, and one reason I'm bringing it up is because we combined it with Thurstonian modeling. Unfolding is the idea that you have a fan, right? And when you, and when you look at the fan in its closed condition, you have yellow blotches, pink blotches, blue, and green. But you don't know what's on the fan yet. It just looks like that to you. So if you think about what happens when you open a fan, you discover that the yellow blotches are not anywhere close to the pink ones. They're not even the same, same thing sometimes. I mean, they're butterflies, yellow butterflies. They can be in a lot of different places, but you've got your, you've got, there's some yellow butterflies there and also yellow roses, and then you've got pink roses, and they're in two completely different parts of that space. But you wouldn't have known that by looking at the, the, the thing. It closed. So the analogy is to liking ratings, average liking ratings. If you think of this as the green ones are the like the most and the, the, red, the yellow and pink are like the least, that's what you see when you do liking rings. When you do an analysis of variance, you're not unfolding anything. You're, you're, you're remixing these two together as if they're the same, just because they're equally liked. But when they're unfolded, you want, to, you want to unfold the fan so that you can see what's inside, what the structure is inside. And uh, that was something that Coombs was thinking about. He was thinking about how do you, how do you uh, take this apart. Like if you think about all the other models, conjoint analysis, models used in economics and psychology that rely on the actual data and then use linear models like maybe it's a logistic regression model or maybe it's another type of model where you add things together to explain results. But you're always predicting the average ratings. You're going to miss really important information. And this is, you will not ever see this fan opened properly if you approach the problem that way. So that's the concept of unfolding. And what, what Coombs proposed was that he basically said, look, people like things because they have developed experience with things. Um, and in their head, they have a concept of an ideal of what they want from past experience. Um, if you're new to a computer, it wouldn't work because you haven't developed any experience. You don't know what you like yet. But if you've been eating certain types of foods and you develop a concept of what you want, he said that um, people's liking is a function of how far apart the ideal is from the product you've given me. That's what he said. And then he said, how do, now we have to turn that into, again, you need a model to make it work. But it's completely different from just analyzing average liking ratings. It's saying that each person has decided they like this because it's they're close to my ideal or it's not close. And again, let's go back to Psychologists think that foods have an effect on you. Food scientists tend to think they're sensory properties. But the psychologist's perspective is better because they say it's, the food has an effect on me and I want to know what the effect is. 
So different people can have different reactions to the same food. So the food can't have fixed sensory properties if that happens. They ha it has to uh, take into account the individual. So he had this idea, great idea, it originated in unfolding. The year I was born, he came up with that. He, cons he, co he considered how to model liking and preference at an individual level. A person's hedonic response depends on similarity to an individual's ideal. The original folding model had items and ideals fixed. He also had the flaw of the determinism. He, he was suffering from that too. And the result of it was that although he had a great idea, it never really panned out because you got degenerate solutions like these due to his determinism. You get th things like the, the, the ideal points were all clustered in the middle and all the products were all around the outside in a big circle, right? So that problem, we solved that problem in 2001 We're using a Thurston, the Thurstonian. That model I showed you right at the bottom of the page is um, extremely commercially valuable. Okay, you say, is there money in models? That one is golden because it solves this problem, a problem people want to know. They want to know what the drivers of liking are. They want to know why people like things and how, why do they differ in what they like. So, this model, this method was now a combination of Thurston and Combs to produce what we call landscape segmentation analysis. There's a, a very good psycho uh, psychologist from the Netherlands who has, um, he has also um, come up with a, a version of this solution. So I'll give him credit. There's another, there are other people as well who have been in, working in this area. But this is a great idea that Combs had, which didn't pan out for 50 years. It sat there with all these problems for 50 years because it had this determinism. And once you allow the, the products to be, have perceptual variance, it makes the, pro, the, the model uh, possible to solve. That solved the degeneracy problem. Here's a couple of papers you can look at. You can also look at chapter seven of the book I just gave you. Um, so how do you model utility? Well, in economics, they might think of modeling utility as a, a variable the hedonic continuum. So if you think about liking as an hedonic continuum, like you would sweetness or sourness or something like that, you're going to get nowhere as far as unfolding is concerned. You're going to be stuck with models that, like conjoint analysis, have to partition the, the, the continuum and ascribe variables to, the, to those partitions. That's what conjoint analysis does. Um, you can also do regression. You do logistic regression. Logistic regression, you have combinations of variables in a function that predicts a, um, a, a binary outcome. You can have that. But you're always stuck with this hedonic continuum. That's what Combs got away from, the hedonic continuum. So let's say we're talking about the price of stocks. This is uh, Altria, ExxonMobil, Ford, P&G on a hedonic continuum and their share prices. But wouldn't we love to unfold the share prices and find out what the market looks like? Unfold it like the fan? So we can see differences between things that might have the same price. But it doesn't explain how data arises. That's what I'd ask you all to do. When you do an experiment and you get data, where did it come from? What caused it? Where, where did you get that probably correct response from or that rating from? So that, challenge yourself with that, that you should ask how did my data come to be? Process models about utility arises from a comparison of an immediate experience or a reference or an ideal. That's what Coombe said. He had a process model for uh, coming up with this. He had single, he was trying to explain why do you get these single peak preference functions? Why is it that liking increases up to a point and then decreases? And he had that idea of utility. He thought, as you increase intensity, now for the stock market it might be unemployment. You want an idea, there's an ideal amount of unemployment. You don't want too little and too much. You want something in the middle. So, and that's true of sweetness, it's true of sourness, it's true of a lot of sensory variables we have to deal with with foods. That they're really, this kind of function that we've seen so often suggests the existence of ideal points. That people are using something they want, that from past experience, and then we're trying to get there. So what we'd like to do is unfold that data. This is a data set that I just showed you was degenerate and it had all the people in the middle and the products on the outside. If you apply the probabilistic unfolding model, you get really nice results based only on liking. Nothing else was known about these things but liking. And yet we know we can see all of these product, these things that all look very similar, right? So sensorially. But these are put here and created by these individual ideal points, knowing that somebody likes these and hates those, Somebody likes this and hates that. 
somebody like kind of likes both of these. There's a structure from the liking information from the individuals that tells you that this is what's going on. And these cluster together and are all very similar. This is extremely sweet, these donut types. This is all done without knowing anything about the sensory properties of these things, only liking. I'm using sensory properties, sensory effects of these things, both language. Um, so you get those, and then you get this thing up here, which isn't sweet at all. So these are, from this, we can find the drivers of liking for these. From, all we did was unfold liking. We didn't even go to a descriptive panel. We now go to a descriptive panel to find out how to describe them. But that's, that's an unfolded solution. We'd like to, that, now you're getting the, the fan unfolded when you do that. And so I'd like to show you how valuable this can be in a lot of different areas. So let's go to FinTech, which is financial tech. And let's say we want to model the market. A lot of people think the market is just a big random mess, right? And that you can't predict anything about it. Well, we didn't find that when we analyzed the stock market. We looked at using the idea of utility of, as measured by the price a person's willing to pay for something tells you something about what that person uh, thinks the value of it is. Um, so uh, using the, so let's just, it's a, beha a behavioral model that we say, you have a small child playing in his back garden, or backyard, we call it in America. In a world of instant accessibility and limitless possibility, the child has lots of toys. Although old, older toys, again, remember experience, Older toys are familiar. So the, this inquisitive child also likes to explore. That's what I think happens in the stock market. There's exploration going on all the time. And unfamiliar in, in the hope of increasing play value. But then if an unexpected negative experience occurs with a new toy, it might bring the child's attention back to familiar toys. So although they don't run to the house yet, like a car backfires or somebody shouts, and they go back to their familiar toys because that scared them. Uh, but then if something really big happens, like lightning or you know, then they run to the house and they leave the whole ensemble there and they just, they go back to the house and they don't participate anymore. And we're seeing a little bit of that lately and we certainly saw it in 2008 and you saw it in 1929, the where people just didn't want to participate anymore. That's the behavioral model. Now we have to turn it into something we can use. So what is the market? The market is an organism or collective that is responding to positive and negative experiences. The market response to an item or utility which economists might call it, depends on what? We're going to say it depends on the similarity of the market to the market's ideal, typical on a given, uh, typical on a given day. And we're going to get the, the ideals by the, the 52-week high. The market's ideal corresponds to an item's reaching its 52-week high. Then it can't really be any better than that. The market's perception of overall health, we have to look at that. How is the market feeling right now? Comf are they confident or not? So Marcus' perception of overall health irrespective of the individual's item utilities has a correspondence in unfolding food samples because there's a bias. When you ask somebody to rate something on liking, they have a bias. That bias corresponds to the market health uh, in, our, in our model. So market health is, is analogous to rating bias in a traditional donic analysis setting. Drivers of utility, uh, drivers of utility choice depends on several underlying latent variables. And what are they? The latent variables are those are not directly measurable but inferred from the data. And uh, the risk attitude is of the market at a given time is what market health measures. The latent variables are, you're giving me these utilities, you're giving me these stock prices, I'm turning them into relative to 52 week highs. But what, how, what are the latent variables? The latent variables are the, the, the market's position in this space of drivers and the um, stocks themselves. And if I know that, I can, know where I am in the market, and I can know whether or not to avoid certain stocks or go after other ones. We have to determine the location of the market in the drivers of utility space, and they would, things that would drive utility would be things like employment reports, tax expectations, elections, interest rate changes, which are all going on and affecting the space, uh, which you can describe later, just like we would have if we were looking at sensory variables and we had the drivers of liking space. The coordinates, um, our, our financial estimates throughout the period of interest. We need those. We need the variances associated with each item, and we need the bias or the market health. Market health is driven by exogenous, highly un unpredictable, usually variables that drive utility for all items on a given date. I like the storm that happens when the child is playing. Those are some of the uh, exogenous variables. And market health can be related to things that, 
that sometimes anticipates changing into doubt. Here's what you'd like to know. You'd like to know from a model you've been using whether or not the market knows something is about to happen, right? Like slowdown in the Chinese economy happened in 2014 to 15, which I'll show you in a minute. And the market health was starting to already decline before the Dow finally took a big hit. That's something you would really like to know. So here's a map of an LSA map, an unfolding map, a Coombs' unfolding model combined with Thurston to produce an equation that I showed you already. It's on the bottom of the page. It's worth a lot to people who use it properly. So this is um, November 2014 to November 5. Why? Because we were working on it at the time. But it also has a, a downturn uh, due to China. And this is 30 stocks in yellow and mark locations in white. Do you see these little dots? Those are like ideal points. In, in, in a, if we were modeling food, we'd be looking at individual ideal points. But we're looking at the market moving through 240 days of, of, uh, of information. Now, is it random? No. And now I'm going to show you a Bezier function, run through those data points. They look random, right? I haven't told you anything about time, but let's look at them as a function of time. Okay, here's the, here's the you'd say it, here's how it moves. That's the market moving. That's what it does. It isn't a random process. It's a very, very consistent and exploratory in the way it works. And now if you look at these, you'd say, well, it starts down here. BA, uh, which is Boeing, is way up at the top. So I must assume then that BA isn't doing very well. Its stock price is down. Its utility is down to where the market is now, right? And so we're going to see that in a second. How good does this model explain all of those changes that occur over the year for all these stocks? Um, we'd like to know that. And why did this sudden change occur in August 2015? It, it, and, and people ascribe it to the China slowdown. And how did that affect all the stocks? And which stocks got most affected by it? So there's an abrupt turn. And Nike, it was, when it reached Nike, then you had a big turn. And then Nike went down. Um, but it favored other ones. Like, uh, it started to help uh, McDonald's because it started to move towards McDonald's. So it did, it, didn't, it did follow a consistent pattern over time to fix stock locations. And then how many data points do we need? How much parameters do we need to explain the data? Like people say, well, you've overfitted the data. You're using way too many parameters. Um, but no, we're not using a lot. We're only using 8% in this 2D. And you can do it in 3D and you get 11%. It's not a big usage of parameters to explain the data. So let's look at Boeing. I said that Boeing should start out low and increase as the market gets closer to it, and it does. And it, it, if you look at the way it, it, it goes, it goes up and then it moves gradually away from Boeing and then it comes back to Boeing. And that's what happens with the, um, with the stock, the price itself. And that's how the, predict, the model predicts what would have happened with, with uh, Boeing. So that's the actual unfitted, and it does quite well. Then if you look at um, uh, McDonald's, McDonald's you'd expect to start to see it increasing, then it should decrease, and then it should come up at the end. It actually goes up a lot at the end, and maybe that's an emotional reaction of the market, but it goes up a lot as the market turns and comes back to it. And similarly, if we look, and there's how the model predicts what it would do. And then um, this is um, ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil is down here. So we'd expect that it would probably be pretty high at the beginning and then decrease and maybe come back. So let's just see what it looks like. Yeah, it, does, it starts high, comes down, and then it does come back. And that's the, the prediction that you got. So that's unfolding. That's looking at a market from, instead of just looking at market prices and linear relating a whole bunch of variables to market prices, we're not doing that. We're starting out with the prices, getting as much out of them as we can, producing these maps and seeing how we can use it. Market health, what happened to it? Well, there's the Dow doing just leverage, a huge drop at that one point. What happened to market health? Market health generally follows the Dow, but you can see in here at, the, at this, if I can get this to work, it doesn't matter, but you can see at about just before 200, before it dropped, market health was already declining. The Dow was happily up there doing its thing. People seemed to be oblivious, but the market had some knowledge that something was happening and started to decline. Then it took a dive down when the Dow took a dive. So maybe you can anticipate those uh, kinds of effects. Um, so that's, that's an LSA application in f FinTech that has not been done before. And that's, it shows the broad applications for the unfolding concept. 
But if you have any questions, I've now finished with my Thurstonian stuff. So do you have any questions so far? OK? Do you, what I want you to do is think about the connection between psychology and food science. Because, and, uh, because all, we can talk about economics, but uh, this is really an important connection. Because the psychologists have a, be a better understanding, and many of them, especially the quantitative ones, of these, um, model, of these methods and models. Maybe they're not using the methods, but they have the right uh, perspective, and they've got the skill. You know, I, I've talked to food science professors. They say, I can't teach that. I, can, I, I wish I could, but I can't teach that. But a quantitative psychologist could really have an influence on, uh, on food science and in the sensory area by bringing to bear their knowledge of these techniques and in, improving the field, I think. Uh, finally, I want to just, this is one of my favorite topics and I hardly ever get a chance to talk about, it, but can chemosensory psychophysics be put on a molecular foundation? Can you do that? Can it be that sweet taste you can put? We know that sweet taste um, comes from receptors and possibly transducers that produce it. But can we create mathematical models for that to, to predict that? This is G-protein signal transduction. An agonist binds a receptor, engages a transducer entity, and the cell polarity changes, and you get a signal. That's the idea behind it. That was not known. When I worked on this in 91, it wasn't known whether humans have this or not. There was some evidence in the chemical senses that uh, that you, you might get, there might be, um, this process could be occurring. Doran Lancet did some stuff in animal experiments that suggested this, might, this process might apply in a chemical census. Uh, it was known to occur in um, beta blockers and antihistamines. James Black won the Nobel Prize in 1989 for the two blockbuster drugs of the 20th century, which is you know, for those two, beta blockers and antihistamine. And he did it by <laughs> figuring out a model that would connect drugs to receptors and bind them, but not engage the transducer entity. That's how a beta blocker works. It binds the receptor, but it can't engage in the second stage. And his Nobel lecture is called Drugs from Emasculate Hormones. They can do the first part, but it can't do the second part. <laughs> so they can have foreplay, but they don't do the rest. So that's, that was his idea. So, and, and he had ways of calculating um, binding constants that correspond to this. So I got interested in this, and I had a dialogue with him while I was working on this. I wanted to go beyond what he had done to take mixtures into account, because there was data around on glucose and fructose mixtures um, that, um, that you can uh, work with. And so I don't want to go into how this is all derived. You can read these papers. 1991, I published a paper in Chemical Senses on this. And what, what I wanted to know was two questions. Um, do we have common receptors or independent receptors? First, we taste. Like, is glucose got its own set of receptors and fructose got its own? Or do they, they work on the same ones? And then, is there a receptor involved? Yes, or, well, there would be. But is there also a transducer or not involved? So we have receptor models and receptor transducer models, common receptors, independent receptors. Which of these work the best? That's the question. Because if you can answer that question, then you can say, in humans, this transduction mechanism probably works. And um, you can say that whether they're going to be uh, common or independent. Um, so here are the results. These, the common receptors in simple binding model doesn't fit this data because you get synergy. When you add glucose and fructose together, you have a synergistic effect, and they can't explain synergy. So those are the equations I just showed you. They're based on uh, low mass action, binding constants, and you get this, these linear relationships. So they don't work. So we can forget about common receptors in simple binding. So then we have independent receptors. Independent receptors work only when you have a transducer. So you do get curvature for our synergy for, um, without the transducer, but it's not enough. See those points? That, these are experiments done by Jan Freiders. Those points are points of subjective equality that he measured in his lab with people, actual people, figuring out what concentrations of glucose molarity, fructose molarity do I need to combine to produce equisensory effects. Those are points of subjective equality obtained from psychological research to produce this, and you get this. And then the model, see how well that model goes through every single point? And it only involves um, something like three parameters to explain all of those curves. These aren't regression curves. These are curves with binding constants that you can draw some conclusions from. Now, the, um, Buck and Axel published, got the Nobel Prize in, in olfaction for showing the independence. They, first of all, they had everything. 
explained and the receptors and everything. So they, and they use the G protein concept too. But they, uh, they, they showed that in their work that these cells are specialized to certain um, uh, chemicals. They're not crossing over so much, which is, really supports the independent assumption I'm talking about here. So in summary, humans do possess a transducer entity chemical sensor. That wasn't known. It may have been known in animals, but it wasn't known in humans. And obviously you can't do the experiments in humans that you could do with animals. So we want to know, can you use psychophysics? Can you use a psychophysical, can you use experiments involving humans that are, um, involve psychophysical measurement and from that say something about the periphery? Say something what's happening at the receptor level. And it looks like we can. We can put chemosensory psychophysics on a molecular foundation. There appear to be independent binding mechanisms for glucose and fructose. So why is fructose sweeter than glucose? Um, because its affinity is greater. So going back to Black's description of you have an affinity to a receptor and then you have a transduction mechanism, or he called it efficacy. So why does fructose sweeter? It's sweeter because its affinity is greater, but its intrinsic efficacy is weaker. But its, its affinity is so much greater that it overcomes that, and that's why fructose is sweeter. And paradoxically, if you were developing a blocker for sweet taste, it would look more like fructose than glucose, even though fructose is sweeter. It's sweeter only because its affinity is greater, but if you could get fructose to lose its, its, its uh, intrinsic efficacy, which is what Black did for beta blockers, you would have a blocker of sweet taste. Sweet taste fructose is it's closer to being a, a blocker than glucose is, even though it tastes sweeter. So that's... That's kind of interesting, because you get these binding concepts and you're out of it. Okay, what's my conclusion? Uh, my conclusion is that thanks to people who encouraged me, like, like Ronan, to go a certain direction, and thanks to the education, excellent education I got in Ireland, I've been able to have a very fun life. And so have you, Ronan, right? You're by your own, peer, your own people who have encouraged you. And, we, and those of us who are in science and have a chance to do this, they have a great time. We don't look back in our lives and regret them. We go back, look back in our lives and really feel good about it. So I started out in agriculture. I got great training in, in my secondary education here. I got great training at UCD. The thing at the uh, education at UCD in agriculture was outstanding at the time. I don't know, it was ranked very high in the world at the time. We got all that basic science and then we got loads of professional training in the last two years. And I really appreciated that. And so I went into food science, got into quality control, which took me into taste testing, which took me into leaving the field and realizing I had to learn from the psychologists because they have the tools and I had to learn the statistics. I had to learn the mathematics. Um, so that was necessary as well. And then the chemical census, which took me into pharmacokinetics. That was models that were <coughs> borrowed from drug. So like treating chemical senses as if they were drugs. It was borrowed from that field. Uh, Blacksfield, Black and Leff, Kennekin, all those guys who don't know anything about the chemical senses, but they are working on drugs. So these models I just gave you could apply to drugs as well. And then mathematical psychology. I owe a huge debt to all the people in mathematical psychology that helped me and I interacted with. And, uh, they, and I gave new models for them. They were interested in those. So that's my, been my cycle. And now I'm back again in a barley field two months ago measuring plant stands in barley because I want and also protein in barley is uh, affected by what we're doing because as you know probably uh, I didn't know this something recently uh, when barley is um, under water stress it produces protein and actually you could be making barley from malt and the malters don't want it if it's got too much protein they can't they can't get the stuff to work properly for them the sugar has gone down and so we've seen great results of low water use no water use actually, relying on the rain uh, with barley, with these things. And I'm back to doing that. So I have this cycle and it's all been very interesting to me. But what, what I think that uh, I would encourage people to do is think about the models. And if you haven't got the skill, develop the skill. It's not, we have the education here in this audience to do this and develop the skills and apply them. If you need to leave the field and go into another field to learn something, then do so. So I'm, uh, that's where I, I feel and I'm so grateful to uh, all the people who have helped me over the years. Uh, and I hope that what I've been able to do is useful to other people. And there's lots to do in this area. Again, remember that sensory science is an important part of um, 
making more healthful products because people, like I said, pre late, there's no, you can't sell nutrition. That's not true. You can sell nutrition so long as you approach the sensory properly and as long as you understand it. So those are my comments. Do you have any questions or comments? It was, it, hopefully it wasn't too technical, was it? No? Yeah. So, um, but you get the message anyway. I have a question for you, Danny. Yes. Um, no. You're talking today to a scientific audience. Now, you spend a lot of time doing webinars and lectures and selling your ideas and your software to companies. Right. How, do you, how would you deliver this to guys and companies who have, have not maybe got a, a deep scientific background? But you would have to present it by case studies, or I don't know how you would do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I talked to the, uh, in the company, uh, the CEO was there, and uh, he said um, to me, nice tie for a scientist. That was the first thing he said to me, nice tie for a scientist. And uh, I said, I was thinking, I didn't say this, but nice smile for a CEO, and he did have a nice <laughs> smile. But, uh, but the, the, the thing is that it, people, people who are in senior management trust you, or they don't trust you. And if they trust you, they don't care about science. And uh, they, they really want, they really understand drivers of liking. This map I just showed you of the stock market can be applied to products too. We can find out people's ideals. We can find out where the segments are. They totally get that. They understand that completely. They have no idea how you got there. But if they trust you and you don't mislead you and you don't mislead them and they use your information to guide a new product introduction or a reformulation, uh, then they will love you and they will keep supporting you forever. That's as long as they're in charge. And so, so long as you can get that across. Some of the tools we have are very visual. That stock market thing is very visual. And if you had products uh, on, in that space that I have there instead of stocks, and if you had the ideal points and they were clustered in certain ways, they get that completely. Marketing people get that, but they don't want to know about the science or the models. And I don't try to tell them. I don't, I don't do that to them. But, uh, but that's how, how you do it with them, I think. And, Benoit is very good with this. The guy who works for me. He's excellent at relating to audiences, technical and non-technical audiences. And um, uh, but uh, we've trademarked drivers of liking. It's a, the words are a trademark of our company. Um, and um, when you and you make predictions from it. So yeah, um, I think when you have nine scientific people, you have to change the way you do it. It's been hard for me because I'm not geared that way. I want to talk about the science. And it's been a hard thing for me to do. And some people are just great at it. And maybe and it's, I've got to learn it. But it's a good point, Ron. I think it's the, the sensory part. That I, I, I love that you're, you're, you're selling the, well, your report or your results to a different audience. So it's not a paper. Mm. So my background isn't so much in the research. It's more in the client based. Mm. So that it actually takes quite a long time to then report it to the format of the person who's hmm. receiving it. You know, you, you're translating it for them so that it's a, they, they see it then. That has become more important lately, where our competition have gotten really good at graphics <laughs> and they're killing us. Mm -hmm. And we have got to get on top of that. So uh, we're, we're now taking courses on, on this stuff so that we can become better at communicating with graphics. Uh, I look at their presentations and I think, oh my God, they're just covering everything up or, you know, so there's that element to it. If you don't, if you don't see what's underneath, uh, you can easily be misled. But, uh, but my competition are very good at this. And um, they, um, and uh, you know, th this is all really an important but part. Not just cover it up, but make it very clear to the right audience what you're, you know, there's lots of, that the scientists could then go deep into the appendices and all of that, but to, to the people who are, this is, you know, people are going to like this and they don't like it. And well, it's, it's important to know what the business objective is. Yeah, you know, like they, the companies are doing it for some reason. So they're either doing it because they're trying to make, they're, they're developing a new product um, or they're reformulating a product and um, if, if you start out with what their objectives are and see whether or not you've, you've satisfied that, um, then that's, um, that, that's the way they'll, they'll relate to you. And they usually tell you very clearly what their business objectives are. Yeah, well, I find it could be hard to get 
they're kind of holding that back. You have to keep asking the questions. Mm. Keep trying, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to do? Yeah, it is. It, sometimes it can be hard. They don't, they don't want to take the time to bother telling Just you. Just go and do it. And you've done the wrong thing or you've gone the wrong direction. It yeah, yeah. There, there's also, there tends to be, um, uh, in, certainly in the marketing area, there tends to be bandwagons. Like you get, um, you get the, uh, the max stiff stuff. Uh, you get Bayesian models. And there, it, be, be, I was asked by people uh, one time at a client, uh, are, what about Bayesian models? They don't even know what a Bayesian model is, but what about Bayesian, well, what about them? You know, so you get questions like that. And, um, but there are, people just get on bandwagon sometimes, and it doesn't help. Emotion research, that had its day too. It's kind of eased off now. But you get all this stuff. Now you've got AI. You know, people think that with AI you can solve everything. But they didn't realize that when they did a, look, a regression, they were, even a user regression model, they were doing AI. I mean, so there's, uh, like, there's that. And that will fade, I suppose, at some point as well. But yeah, you need to know what a client's reason for doing this test, why they're spending the money on it, and um, how you can help them. Uh, and it, these issues arise too in, in advertising claim support. We were involved recently with um, PNGs. Uh, I can say this now because it's public stuff, but PNGs for Breeze product. You're all familiar with Breeze, right? Well, now they got a problem because uh, the end, they were um, they, the the SC, SC Johnson brought them uh, up on that with the National Advertising Division, who adjudicate <laughs> advertising in the U.S. That their claim that to eliminate odors isn't isn't supported, and I was involved in that, and they. And they, they lost that case. And then it was appealed and they lost on the appeal. So they're, they're not going to, and now they have a class action lawsuit against them. You know, so it's kind of um, important to figure, there's a good example of what you're saying. The testing that was done, support P&G was not appropriate. Didn't fit the, it didn't fit the claim. It was inappropriate to the situation, which I was able to show. And, um, and, uh, and if you can do that, and you can do it effectively in advertising claims, or in helping company to achieve their objectives, if they know what their objectives are, that's, um, that can be very valuable. That's not always easy to know what that is. Did you have to physically test the aromas? Pardon? So in the Fabrice case, did you have to physically test? There was a lot of testing done. Here, here's what I said about PNG when I testified on it, is that they did the wrong thing, and the thing they did wrong was done poorly anyway. So. Mm -hmm. Those are the two things they, they, they didn't. And so they, I can tell you basically what it was, was they should have done, if they're going to claim to have eliminated odors, odorants, they said eliminate odors, odors at the molecular level. Okay, that means that they've eliminated the odorants and they show pictures of the chemicals disappearing. They never did any analytical chemistry to really prove that, that I could, that they presented anyway. Second thing is, if they meant to reduce the odor and concentration that we can't smell it, they should have done studies about thresholds. They never did those. So what they did was a series of sensory experiments, kind of the stuff that we do and you do. Uh, they did sensory experiments in the hope that, and established an equivalence criterion that was way too wide. You drive a truck through it, uh, so that when they, you know, anything would have fit into it. Uh, they, th that was what I mean by done poorly, but they were relying on the wrong data. So um, that's a classic case of getting the right objective, like you just brought up, uh, and they didn't have that. And they, at that meeting, at the NARB meeting, the appeal meeting, they brought everybody. They brought all their lawyers, all their experts, and the more they brought, the worse it seemed to get. So to me, as it looked like, and our side only had a small number of people. We didn't need a lot of people to make our point. Anyway, I can't say a lot more about it than that, because it's all a part of the proceeding. But, it, but it's, it's a serious problem. And they said they've spent 20 years worth. One of their arguments was, well, why are you coming at us now 20 years later? We've been talking about this for 20 years. And that's like to the, the uh, class action folks, that's just honey. Yeah, you've been doing it for 20 years, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it wasn't too technical. I hope that you saw the point of understanding, getting with, somehow, bringing in qualitative psychologists into this area. Uh, and I hope you see the broad applications for the Sertonian structure, and I hope you see um, the Combs connection, that that's a really good connection, that unfolding 
is absolutely golden idea, a great idea that Coombs came up with. And it's a pity that he couldn't live out and see how it was going to be so useful. Can I just ask one question? Maybe it's because you're in an academic environment that you're talking about your academic training um, and the importance of going back for you to have a skill set in terms of mathematical psychology. With today, I think we're operating certainly at an academic level of encouraging more interdisciplinary science. So mm. rather than me as a food scientist trained to become mm. a mathematical psychologist, I link up with the psychology department and find that person there and so on and mm. so forth, all the different disciplines that might contribute to the end goal. So are you, are you still encouraging more that everybody has to have the in-depth knowledge themselves or are you happy with the concept of linking the right people in the area? Well, together? yeah, it's not going to be possible to take that stuff and put on, uh, it's in that book, Tertiary Modeling book, and expect all of the food scientists to derive all those equations. That's not possible. But it is a good idea for them to understand what's involved. I mean, a quantitative psychologist who could come into the food science and give some lectures uh, to explain what models are, why they're important, and what kinds of models we have available, then if they understand generally the idea behind it and can use the software intelligently, that's okay. I mean, people who run triangle tests and get D primes out of them, deltas out of them, they don't really know how it came to be, but they understand why they're doing it. Um, I'm sure that's true in chemistry too. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of chemistry running that, that uh, for scientists don't understand and never will understand, but, um, but they use, they're using things that are based on that, right? So the deeper, the better, but you can't, you can't expect undergraduates to get an up to a certain level. So I'm talking about really a qualitative shift. I'm talking about uh, bringing people together that normally wouldn't talk to each other. I mean, I think the example of uh, sensory properties is a good example. Uh, to a psychologist, that doesn't make sense, right? Who's the psychologist, right? You. So you're, you're not going, you, you want to know, stimuli are for, their effect on people, right? That's what you're interested in. So they're not properties of the food, like calcium is. You know, they're effects on people. And then the marketing science people are thinking of segmentation. So of course, there are going to be different reactions depending on who the person is. That's an important idea for food scientists to grasp in sensory. If they get that, that'll be good. Then, then they will, um, they'll use that properly to think about segmentation. Okay, have we gone over? Can I just follow up on that point, actually, and just from the psychologist's point of view, I guess. But, um, I just had a question. It goes back to the beginning of your presentation where you were talking about, I think, the alternative force choice is a little bit better in terms of cost-effectiveness than the geo mm. Right, it is, yeah. Um, does that also apply if you're testing children, for instance? Well, we, we had, there was a woman who attended one of our courses, um, and she um, was doing our PhD in food science. And she went out, she was from Honduras, and she did experiments with children, six to uh, six year olds to 11 year olds, with the tetrad method. And she was able to establish the uh, superiority of the tetrad method to the triangle test with children with, with uh, solutions that she made up, you know, orange juice and you know, other kinds of solutions. So she did, um, she demonstrated the value of the, Thurstone, of the um, first of all, the value of the Thurstonian model. You never, see, you won't know any of this unless you have the models. So let's not forget that, that without the models, you won't know that the tetrad is a better method. You could experimentally find out maybe, but you're predicting it from a model. So she was able to, to do that with children. And actually the children, they came up with, okay, they said to her, it's a really funny thing. If th the three things is a triangle test, then why don't you call this the square test? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And then, you know, John started to use squares after that when he ever showed the tetrad method. Yeah, you can do those. Children actually like the tetrad method. They understand it. It's a, in some ways, it's an easier way to, it's, it's an easier experiment to conduct and to balance it properly. And uh, would you have to modify the model and like the equations in any way to kind of account for different perceptual decision making among children? Or would you have to modify the model if? Um, for like the equations, for instance. So, um, under what conditions would you need to modify? You, if you, have, you might have to for some conditions. What are the ones you're thinking of? the different types of decision rules sometimes or how they reach their decision. Different types of? 
Decision rules. Decision rules. Well, yeah, there are, there are, there are, each method has its decision rule mm -hmm. under ideal circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, so are you asking me how you would have to extend it? Um, yeah, I was just wondering, like, would there be any need to extend it if you're testing different types of populations, for instance, or is it just a universal method? Well, there's a, there's a universal underlying model, right? And then we have to, uh, we have experimental variables that affect the outcome, um, like uh, uh, resampling. <coughs> and that's, an, that's where the, the variance, with resampling, the variance might go down if somebody is allowed to retaste. Um, so that's one, look, if you don't allow retasting, you have a model. If you allow retasting, you have a somewhat modified version of it. Um, memory uh, effects and decay in memory, uh, an example is the duo trio, should you put the reference first and then get the two, or should you put it in the middle and present a sample, the reference, and then the other sample, reducing the memory load? If you do that, it affects, the, the model would have to be adjusted. The thing is that the, and if you train people. So all of these things have to be considered in the Thurstonian context. How does, re, how does training get translated into the model? It gets translated in terms of the perceptual variance. The perceptual variance decreases and the D primes go up because you're dividing by the by the standard deviation. So you get the reason why people have bigger uh, discrimination uh, measures in Thurston, Thurston's language will be because their um, the variance is going down. And that makes the D prime bigger. And so if you're looking at internal testing versus consumer testing and you want to translate one to the other, which companies always want to do because it saves money, then uh, you need to know how much better are your internal panelists are picking up a difference than the consumers? And what's the translation? How do you adjust the equations so they will account for, for uh, the fact that you've trained people versus consumers that you haven't trained? So yeah, there's all, those are all things you can build on. But those are not things that throw the model away. They just mean you modify the model according to the conditions. You guys good? Do all, do all of you do all of you have those this book? I have some more if you want it. If you can take them as you're leaving, and if you have people you want to give them to, I won't be taking them home. They'll be fine. We ha we have another book. Um, I, have just, I have just one other thing to say about that. He's worked this gate for fifty years. He still has his double and four. Right? <laughs> 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 there, uh, there's some. I mean, you can just continue the conversation. So there's some refreshments just small out there if you want to have a pleasure talk. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be good. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks. Thanks.